Hey friends, welcome to another episode of the 10 Laws Podcast with East Forest. I am Mr. Forrest. How you doing? Thank you for listening and subscribing. And thank you to all of our council members on our Patreon, which is the way you can support this podcast directly in many different forms and shapes. Check it out, eastforest.org. Scroll down on the homepage and you'll see the information about the East Forest Council on Patreon. This week, I have a conversation with Steve Urquhart. Steve is a really, really interesting guy. He used to be a uh, state legislator in Utah. Yeah, he was a Republican. I'm pretty sure we talk about this. And he went through some changes in life. And now he is uh, no longer a state legislator, but he has started something called the Divine Assembly, which is a church that uses psilocybin as a sacred sacrament for worship. And they do this. They have a website. You could join if you want. Uh, They're having a summer revival uh, celebration. It's basically a, uh, what's it called? A um, festival, (laughs) June 18th through June 20th. So in a couple days here, this is in 2021. It's a three-day, two-night camping thing at Sea Base. This is just outside. It's a playa outside of Salt Lake City in Utah. Uh, The link for that is in show notes if you want to check it out or the Divine Assembly in general. But Steve just basically is very open and vulnerable, and I really appreciated me being to ask all sorts of questions. And I think you're going to find uh, his story, both personally and what they're doing out there in the world, as extremely interesting, especially in this movement of the psychedelic renaissance that we find ourselves in. Uh, This is most definitely on the vanguard from the religious freedom front, and they're out there doing it. And so um, we had other conversations like this on the podcast, but this one uh, is in the state of Utah, which is where I have a home as well. And uh, I I know you're going to find this absolutely fascinating. So we're going to dive into that. Uh, But first, I just want to say thanks. I hope you're enjoying that new song that we released from the Possible album called Bones, featuring Bioaco Malafe. It is out wherever you listen to music, and I'm going to play it again at the end of this podcast. Bio was on, I believe, uh, podcast 112 of this show. One of my favorite people and a brilliant mind and a beautiful heart. Go back and listen to that podcast if you haven't already, because it's one of my favorites. And I sampled some bits from that podcast and put them in this song called Bones. And I just think it's, I just love it. So thanks for everyone who's been sharing it and all your messages of warmth and support on social media, at East Forest Instagram and at East Forest Music elsewhere. And you can always say hi at team at eastforest.org. I'm in New York right now. So I'm recording this on Sunday. I leave tomorrow for New York City. We're going to be shooting some... uh, live versions of a few songs from the Possible record with a string section at uh, One RPM Studios. I'm really, really excited about that. So I'll tell you how that goes after it happens. And also going to be just shooting some footage with my friend Mark of Mark Tom Photography. We're going to be walking around the city to all my old haunts. We're kind of been progressively and very organically, we've been filming sort of like a lot of the story of not just my story, but the story of like this whole greater movement that I, I'm a part of and you're a part of. And Mark came out to uh, to Utah, and we filmed out there and all these beautiful rural you know, canyons and locations and petroglyphs in the background and rivers. And now we're going to New York City because he lives there and I used to live there, and that's a big part of the story. So it's just, it's fun. It's kind of fun to be able to piece that together, and maybe that could become some sort of piece that we can we can share in the future, that would just be the next step. Um, but the possible album, it is available for pre-order on vinyl at eastforce.org. If you want to get one of your limited edition first pressings on this iridescent blue, it's beautiful. That'll ship out in July, so really soon. So grab one if you want one at the, the store at eastforce.org. And we also have those cool new sweatshirts and women's tanks all that stuff's in the store, along with the perfume oils. And so anyway, thank you for your support. I really do appreciate uh, all, if you find a way that's the right way for you to support this project and the podcast, whether it's the Patreon and or the store or coming to a show or just saying hi and sharing the music, 
I love it. And of course, the reviews, uh, five-star review is super easy to do. While I'm gibbering and jabbering, you can just go down there on Apple Podcasts and do that. And the written ones are great too, but even if you don't have time for that, five stars is awesome. It helps us get the guests that you want to hear. On that note, let's get into this uh, conversation with our new friend, Steve Urquhart. Steve Urquhart, thank you so much for taking the time to jump on the podcast. How are you doing? Great, great. Good to be with you. What a pleasure. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. So before we get into this, uh, it probably would behoove listeners if they get a little bit of background on how we cross paths and uh, the basics of what you're up to, because I, I, I have a lot of questions and I'm sure other people will too. Sure. So maybe we could just start there. Sure. Um, yeah. So uh, I grew up Mormon, joined the church when I was 10 and left it and left, uh, you know, I think with some religious trauma, I joined it when I was 10 and uh, that kind of arrested my spiritual development. I had the answer key. Right. And so once you have the answer key, you don't think, <laughs> you don't think right. you don't process and you don't, I not think you die spiritually. And so I uh, stopped believing the faith around 2009 and uh, just figured it was all fake. There is no God, Um, just rejected it all. And, you know, uh, without having developed my own moral ethical compass, uh, you know, uh, didn't do too well. Uh, You know, just uh, alcohol, drugs. Uh, affairs. It was it was a mess, and all this while I'm in the state senate, so just hiding a lot and hiding for myself, hiding from in everyone. Utah, right? Yeah. In Utah, yeah, yeah. So you're a state so, senator in Utah who went through a personal crisis around 2009, as far yeah. as existentially, yeah, and that and bled into your personal life, right? So my last three years in the Senate, um, I'm getting a lot done legislatively, uh, fought for LGBTQ rights successfully in Utah, fighting against the Mormon church, which is important that factors into the story. And, uh, but the last three years I was drunk and or stoned every single day. I mean, I was just a mess. Wow. I wasn't opening mail, uh, which is bad for a Senator and a lawyer, um, attempted suicide and, uh, just a mess. So got out. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But I got out in 2016, and uh, my wife, who, you know, because of my mess, but then, you know, a few things with her, she too abandoned the faith. Um, We both were kind of lost, and we had friends who uh, had found ayahuasca, and they were healing, and uh, we tried it in 2017, and uh, really felt a lot of healing. And, uh, then I found psilocybin and really got into that. And, you know, I imagine we'll backfill some of the details, but I started a psilocybin church and, and I'll quickly give you how the, my legislative battles factored in fighting against the Mormon church for LGBTQ rights. They kept raising the religious freedom restoration act, the first amendment Uh, talking about their religious liberties. So a constitutional law professor and I, we dug deep into it. And I was having these profoundly spiritual, I'd say religious experiences, and figured, you know, these deserve as much protection as any other religious experiences. And so started the Divine Assembly, which, yes, we have a psilocybin sacrament, but more than being about psychedelics and psilocybin, it's about building community. Okay. Yeah, there is a lot of dots to connect there. So yeah. the story is you were a Mormon in Utah, a state senator. Were you always on the more progressive side politically? No, no, okay. I, no, no, Chris, no, I came in uh, a Republican from a very conservative part of the state. And, uh, you know, I look back with a lot of embarrassments. I was just sucking in all the doctrine and Truly, yeah. some would dispute this, but with M- Mormonism comes conservative politics. And, uh, you know, a couple of votes I look back on and I'm very embarrassed. Uh, uh, you know, I voted for Utah's version of Prop 8, you know, Prop, 
prop three, we had it. And I just, I didn't even think about it. You know, it was just a moral issue of right and wrong. And so by the time 2016, my politics had just changed so much. I figured this wouldn't be fair to my constituents. And I don't, I'm just so changed. Uh, so I'm no longer a Republican. I'm independent and uh, have, having a lot of fun on my journey, learning a lot. So the change politically, let's just focus on that for a second. Was that precipitated by psilocybin or was it ayahuasca or not, none of the above? Neither. I'd say that changing my heart um, is what led me to psychedelics. Um, I, I, My daughter was the president of the Gay-Straight Alliance in her high school. So a constituent emailed me and just lit me up that my daughter's awful, uh, my wife and oh, I must God. be awful parents. And oh. um, she, her intent was to move me, and brother, she moved me, but <laughs> not in the direction she wanted. And so uh, Equality Utah, I'm on their board now, they had come to me a few years before saying, hey, we need a Republican sponsor for non-discrimination legislation. Would you do it? I said, look, I'm I'm there personally, but my constituents aren't. No, not interested. But then in 2013, I said, hey, you know that non-discrimination bill? I'd, I'd love to run that. And uh, we had a three-year battle to pass it. And that changed me. You know, and this is the fun in life. I wish I'd been better younger, but I'm 55, about to turn 56, and there's a lot of discovery. I think I'm approaching life wide-eyed like an eight-year-old and learning, mm. oh, I was wrong about this. This is exciting. This is fun. And so that really changed me was seeing uh, the world as a bigger place and understanding how wrong I was on LGBTQ rights. And that answer key I got, Christian, it was all wrong. The answers were all wrong. <laughs> So it kind of sounds like the the thing that cracked the door initially was your daughter in a way, like her taking that charge personally caused some other things that made you sort of look at that and maybe, you know, someone else criticizing you, getting angry about that in a way. And then, but if from there, like, did that just get you on a a, a path of sort of inquiry, self-inquiry? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. You know, just, you know, I would see, it, it's bigotry, right? I mean, I would see people through their sexuality. And I never intended to be mean or anything, but, you know, here's here's my friend. Uh, he's gay. And he's a lawyer. He loves Willie Nelson and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But that that's the filter. Not that I thought it mattered to me, but, but of, of course it did. Because right now I don't care what anyone's sexuality is. I don't see people as, you know this sexuality, that sexuality. And so when, when someone started picking on my daughter, who at the time, now she was born a unicorn. And I don't just mean sexually, I mean in every way. She's really an interesting, unique person. And just seeing her become the target of someone's hatred, you know, at first, I thought it was a political issue, right? And right. seeing that, oh, this isn't a political itch, issue. This is an issue of right and wrong. This is a human rights issue. And uh, it just opened up. I don't know if many people can say they left the left politics a better person, but that just it really opened my heart. I mean, like the Grinch, my heart was two sizes bigger when I left the legislature. But you went through that period of it sounds like really struggling with you said of sort of nihilistic feelings about the world. And was that because you were basically in the process? You were kind of like breaking things down or were you really feeling quite lost about where to go next with it all? Oh, just a hundred percent lost. Um, you know, you realize that religious answer key is made up, you know, you've been living by the rules of Harry Potter or whatever, something made up and, uh, you just feel lost and kind of bitter and, uh, nothing really has meaning. And so, uh, you know, part of it is you just want to try everything because you realize you've been missing out. But then also, you know, I think a lot of it was just to distract myself so I, I wouldn't kill myself. I mean, you know, I was just very suicidal, very depressed. And what what can s- sort of turn off the default mode network? And this is a bad way of doing it. But um, drugs, alcohol, 
uh, sex, which can be great, but not for a married man where I'm lying to my wife about it and just anything to just kind of escape the moment. I just hated being present. So did initially like psychedelics, or let's just talk about psilocybin, was it doorway in another form of escape or talk to me about how you, you led your way into that? So everything had kind of blown up in my life um, as I'm sneaking out of the legislature without everything making headlines, still just hiding, still a lot of shame. Now, you know, I'm quite open about it. And, uh, because of my friends and their example, we went into psychedelics, you know, again, the first ayahuasca experience, I think in a good way. It wasn't trying to escape. It was trying to heal, looking for something. And uh, right away, just my creativity and any psychedelic I do, the first experience is really kind and gentle and expansive where I see the possibilities and I had no idea that I had that kind of creativity, and I just felt all of this connection. And uh, my wife is very pragmatic. She's a little on the spectrum, and she went in with a list of five things. And mm -hmm. number three was Steve, question mark. And <laughs> That's a big Steve, question mark. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so wow. she showed me afterwards. She wrote down, Steve loves me as much as he can. It's not enough. So... I figured, yeah, that's about right. I'm broken. And uh, it never occurred to either of us that I could learn to love more. And that's a huge part of the journey that it could be meditation. It could be music. It can be so many things that get us in this non-normal state of consciousness. But psychedelics really kickstarted my journey to where the whole journey, I think I can sum it up. It's just saying learning to love. And it started by learning to love myself. Which, so I, your which I did not before that. I just, I hated everything about myself. Mm -hmm. So the ayahuasca experiences led to you. How did you find psilocybin? Had you before in your life? Or like, where did that come in? So I did um, six different ceremonies over two years of ayahuasca. And then uh, one of the same friends who introduced me to ayahuasca, he said, hey, some friends and I are going to, have a mushroom ceremony in at my house. Do you want to come? And I came and it's, uh, it was just fantastic where to me, I don't see a big qualitative difference between ayahuasca and psilocybin. It got me back to uh, that mystical state of consciousness and the journey continued. And I just had some tremendous uh, insights along the way. All right. And but it seems to be the ally you've sort of aligned yourself with as a medicine moving forward, because eventually I want to figure out how it, that went from there to you deciding to start essentially a mushroom church, yeah. uh, which is a bold move. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we're following this journey from being a, a Mormon Republican uh, senator to a mushroom church. So where's the journey to starting a church? Okay, so I'll, I have to walk you through a couple of experiences. So I'm using psilocybin, um, and I was using it with ayahuasca at the time. Um, so both of them. But uh, I went back to when I was 10 years old, and which happens to be when I got that answer key. And I was just so lost. I was a crossing guard. I had an official sash and a silver badge, a cane pole with a sign on the end that said stop. And I would pick the least trafficked corner and just cry. I would just sit there and cry. And when other students were coming, I'd wipe my tears and get them across the street. And I'd just go back to crying because I was so alone. My brother had killed himself. He was 19 and no adult ever wow. talked to me about it. Um, I was just so alone. And then, uh, you know, then alienated from other people through this religion, you know, that has different standards. And um, the religion just set me on a course where there's a scripture in Mormonism, the natural man is the enemy of God. And so think about that. Everything, every natural instinct you have, you're wrong. And you got to correct right. that. And so um, during this ceremony, I uh, 
I was on that corner just so alone and lonely. And so the guide helped me with it, helped me process. And so he said, I think it's time to let this go. And so I sat up, I said, what do you mean by that? You know, that's pretty flippant. What do you mean just let it go? How am I supposed to? I don't even know what it is. And he's just the best. He laughed and he said, I have no idea. He said, why don't you ask the medicine? And so I asked the medicine and uh, I I saw my soul and it was noble. And I'd always thought I was kind of this pathetic loser kid, but I was strong. I mean, this was a tough experience and I got through it. And so I think that younger me sent strength and, and perspective to me. And I saw that my soul is strong and noble. And so at that moment, uh, my inner voice changed. I mean, I used to just, I was brutal to myself. I'm very kind to other people. I was very brutal. That stopped. I mean, now my inner dialogue is is calm and respectful. And so then in the next ceremony, um, you know, I can go into more detail if you want, but uh, I realized that I... Uh, didn't ever in my life love fully and fiercely that I only loved partially. And, uh, that was such a sad thing to realize. I and mean, I was just sobbing and, but I always get lifted. Fortunately, you know, when I go deep in a ceremony, I do get lifted by the possibilities that this is opportunity to change. And so I, I integrate everything with my wife, Sarah, and I came home, told her about this, and she reminded me of our first experience. I'd forgotten it about Steve loves me as much as he can. Can It's not enough. And so uh, we thought that was awesome. I, I think I wasn't ready for the full import. Either of us were at the time, but through these experiences, which each one adds on the last, on the previous ones, it was time where I could learn to love more. And so I started seeing that, okay, I think this might be more or as much the psilocybin as the ayahuasca. And so that's when I really gained more of a respect for psilocybin. It wasn't this ancillary add-on thing to ayahuasca. It might be the thing for me. And so I uh, had some friends with some folks and they were all like, no, please don't start a religion. Please don't. That's weird. <laughs> but this, this constitutional law professor that we fought and are still fighting the LGBTQ uh, war against the Mormon church on, I told him this story. I said, I'm having these spiritual, religious, profound experiences, and I think they should be legally protected. And so he said, just tell me at the end of the story that you're starting a psilocybin church and I'm your lawyer. And, uh, with, with his skills and his backing, I thought, yeah, let's do this. And, you know, my kids are grown and gone. Um, you know, my, my business wise, money wise, you know, I'm taking care of myself. So I figured I have a lot less to lose than other folks. And so I'm happy to put out the divine assembly and allow people to worship and have some legal protection while they do that. So it, is this a first of its kind in at least the United States? Well, it might be with psilocybin. I don't know of any others. But, uh, you know, of course, as, as you're aware, there, there are many entheogenic churches, uh, some great court cases on ayahuasca church. In Oregon, right? Yeah. yeah the, a... the Santa Dima case in Oregon. Yeah. And then the United States Supreme Court case uh, with udv down in new mexico yeah and so psilocybin is kind of the next thing all of the rationale of those cases would apply to psilocybin which breaks it down to under the religious freedom restoration act is this practice safe which psilocybin it can be very safe and is it sincerely religion and so we're not pretending about safety or sincerity um a lot of people come saying, oh, man, I don't want to join a religion. I'm like, okay, well, you don't have to, but that's where the protections apply. The protections aren't for spirituality, right. philosophies, or anything like that. Um, and what I say is religion itself, it isn't a bad word. It, it has a lot of baggage. But how about we reinvent religion? How about we reinvent the concept of worship and figure out what works for us collectively or what works for you individually 
well, frankly, it's a it's a me- mechanism and a tool for you know inner inquiry, spirituality, meaning, depth in your life. It's just a word, and, yeah. and, and in this case, it's a it's a legal tool. Uh, that's totally fair to say. Like, all right, we're going to use this tool uh, to do what, in some ways, you could argue, other folks are using it in a in a more empty way, or it's more of a tax mm-hmm. issues. But uh, so, what kind of pushback? have you experienced if any because he let's be i mean look you're in you're in the state of utah of all the states it's it's of the small there's in a a small grouping that has a bit more stringent views shall we say and this is coming from someone who spends a lot of time in utah has a residence in utah yeah i mean you know utah well and so if you know utah well from the outside it seems weird but it's it's really not that strange because uh, kind of like Austin in Texas, where you have strong culture, you have strong counterculture. Um, so there's there's a big group that's receptive to this. And what I've done is I want to walk through the front door. So I've talked with prosecutors. I've talked with law enforcement. That's a big part of what I do is going mm-hmm. and explaining to them, here's exactly what we do. Here's how we do it. Um, here's what we do for safety and we are very safe. I can walk through that if you'd like. And we're, yeah, we'll get and we're sincere about that. And here's the law on it. I give them a legal primer. And uh, I say, if you feel the need to uh, intercede, here's my address. Here's my phone number. You want me, you don't want anyone else. If you decide you have to do something and by all means, don't ever interrupt one of our ceremonies because you'd be, traumatizing some people and think about it. That's not really what you want to do. And, you know, I've, I've spent a couple decades by now working with law enforcement, um, working through difficult issues and finding solutions. So they respect me. They think it's kind of weird, uh, but I think they get it. So that's on a state level or county level. What about on a federal level? Has there ever been any, uh, poking around just from the DEA, that kind of stuff? That I know of, no. Um, You know, and the feds are in an interesting position because uh, they lost the two ayahuasca cases and they don't want to lose another. And Jeff Sessions in 2017, when he was attorney general, he wrote a memo thinking of the good evangelicals saying to government, look, if, if people mention religion, you just back away. And uh, so the feds, that still is the directive that they're operating under. It's strange, though, because like uh, there's still prosecutions going on about cannabis yeah. from a federal level. And it, it doesn't always like comply with what's happening on a state level or even sort of like what you're hearing sometimes a language. But Biden seems to be quite conservative about uh, just uh, kind of old school on like marijuana yeah. and stuff. It's like, dude, that ship has sailed. It's yeah. like now psilocybin's coming up right behind it. And it's like, I'm just curious if like there is a directive on a federal level that's sort of, that is emerging. That's if it's sort of saying hands off or if it actually is like, so you know, the Obama times, there'd be raids happening at the yeah. same time. You know, it's like, what's going on here? You know? Well, that's one that the the ship has sailed. There are 33 states um, that have legal cannabis in some form out in the West. As you know, uh, every state has some form of legal cannabis, except for uh, Idaho, Wyoming. Wyoming even has CBD. And the the grow laws, everything's really progressive out West. So at least out West, marijuana laws are largely unenforceable. But a lot of that has to do with skin color and and socioeconomics. And so, you know, I think white people, we can get in a basement and do psilocybin anytime we feel like, and we're probably going to be fine. The same isn't true for people of color. We definitely have a two-tiered legal system. And so that's a big part of the reason I want to do this is it shouldn't just be some group where law enforcement looks the other way and others are going to go to jail. Everyone should be entitled to protections. And if they want to worship with this, they should be allowed to do it. Do you think that it will change uh, moving forward if like money starts to come into play? You know, you think about some churches when it, you know, a lot of cash starts flowing through and then it's like that's where more attention comes to it as opposed to just the religious angle. 
Yeah, I mean, I look at um, psilocybin in particular, and you look at the amazing studies that are going on at Johns Hopkins, Imperial College of London, all of these places. And I mean, you've had some involvement with Johns Hopkins, right? Uh, a little bit, and then Imperial College uh, a bit more. Okay. Uh, yeah. And so that just destigmatizes it. It's it's cannabis. Yeah. It's interesting, though it's legal in so many places. It's still not that destigmatized. I mean, so much was thrown at vilifying cannabis that I I love helping other people start their entheogenic churches. So anyone listening, uh, you know, hit me up if you're if you have an underground entheogenic church, if you want to start one. Um, And people talk to me about, okay, can I do a cannabis church? And I say, you know, theoretically, you should be able to. That should be easier than psilocybin and other things. But there's never been a winner. There have been a lot of tries in that. And it's just so vilified that by the time you get to a human judge, they think, okay, either it's the devil's lettuce or... (laughs) <laughs> well, you're not serious about it. Everyone, you, that's kind of like a tobacco church. So cannabis, it's just tough. And again, you look at all the, the work going forward. So I teach at the University of Utah Medical School. I teach health policy. And so you know, I'm watching a lot about health policy. Cannabis studies, they proceed apace. Or did I say cannabis? Psilocybin. Whereas cannabis, they don't because you, you need to buy you need to get your cannabis from government grow and they're crummy growers with crummy strains. And so there still isn't a lot of great cannabis research going on. That's crazy. It is crazy. Yeah. So what does it look like um, operating this church? Like, what does that mean? Uh, what is the, how, it, t- walk us through, like you, t- you mentioned some ceremonies. Yeah. You know, I, I'm curious about even just the mechanics of these ceremonies, like how you do them. Well, at some point, we would love to, to team up with you and uh, have you uh, play the soundtrack and lead us in an experience. And Definitely, definitely. Um, we did a big one out uh, on the Salt Flats, and uh, it was fun. It was neat. It was great to gather, kind of post-COVID. Um, and I learned a lot about that. There was a lot right about it, but a lot wrong about it. Um, you know, it wasn't the best container for, that's a huge part of it (laughs) for people who were and a lot of people who are coming to us, they're older and they're, they're not necessarily politically conservative, but they kind of live, live these conservative lifestyles where they're not big risk takers. And this is new to them. And even on two grams, we tend to do very low doses. We just kind of want to help people dip their toes in the water meet guides, meet other people who are there, and then go worship with them in another place. I don't want to be anyone's replacement church, replacement whatever, religion-wise. It's all about connection and community. So it doesn't have to happen through us. Come integrate with us, do other ceremonies with us, but then go off and worship. Mycelial network, go off and worship with others and bring them in. But may, may I interject a question? Yeah. When you yeah. say worship, you mean take uh, medicine, I assume. And But if they're doing that outside, literally outside of one of your congregational gatherings, is it under the same protections if they have basically said, I've joined this church? Sure, absolutely. Um, what they're going to do is uh, they're going to look at the church. Is the church safe and sincere? Well, yes, it is. Um, they'd be hard pressed to make a case that we're not. Then they'll look at the individual who they're uh, dealing with. Is this person doing it in a safe way? Is this person sincere about it? And it might be a painful, long experience to victory, but um, you should prevail legally on this. And I have a lot of friends who are judges, and I bounce this off of them, and, you know, very good judges. And uh, they've helped me think through this. And they say, look, there's not always perfect justice in the system. We know that, but this is this is a solid case. But what are the pitfalls people might uh, go through if they're trying to essentially do this where they're playing along with this legal system? Does it have anything to do with money changing hands or is there anything else you could share with us that's like 
a no-no as far as finding yourself in trouble? Yeah. So I think we, I started out by thinking, I want everyone to have this. And it just was instantly too big, too fast. And so we pulled back and our ceremonies now are quite small. They're indoor, better container. Uh, we're going to have our big revival June 18 through 20. Um, that's going to be outdoors. We're, we're advertising it as a sober experience and I hope it is. Um, it sure will be for me, but you know, we're going to have a, a quiet space. We're going to have, uh, our version of Rangers. We're going to do a lot of things in case people do ingest, but, um, that's where you would get in trouble is if people have bad experiences, especially if anyone gets hurt anyone goes and complains to the police. For the most part, if you're keeping people safe, uh, there, there are a lot of crimes being committed that do hurt people and police tend to focus on those things. So I think that just what the neat thing about it is the legal standards, safety and sincerity. Well, that's what churches should be focused on anyway. And so we keep doubling back on it. Is this safe? Are we safe? does this show our sincerity and are we being sincere? Are we being too glib, too flippant? And it's a fun opportunity for us to re-examine ritual and re-examine the very concept of worship, which worship means to discover our own self-worth. And so what does it mean to worship? And yes, we have periods where we're on the floor sobbing, it's sad, and we're reliving traumas, but then we don't hold back on the elation either. There are points where we're just silly, frivolous. We're just having a lot of fun, just hopefully showing and teaching ourselves that worship can be really upbeat and positive too. So are you using music or is it in the dark? Is it, is it, how are you engaging the actual work itself? Yeah, we, we almost, okay. So we start out, um, we have, we circle up and we prep people. Here are some things you need to read. Uh, let's have some conversations. We've really, since those first ex experiences where people went really deep on two grams, I'm like, oh boy, we need to really ramp up the preparation. And so we're still in the process of doing that, improving and honing all of our protocols and procedures. But then at the ceremony, we'll circle up, talk about intentions. Here's the experience. We stay in the container. And um, then we almost always have music. We have some of your music often. And um, we tell people, bring earphones and your own music or ambient sound, bring blindfolds, because a mushroom journey, it's up and down. And it's mm -hmm. kind of like herding cats. Not everyone is going to want to do the same thing at the same time. So be aware of that. And if you want to check out and do your own thing, that's sometimes extremely beneficial to do the blindfolds and earphones. And then if you want to interact with other folks, take them off. And, and so a lot of activities, a lot of things we can manipulate, and then a lot of small group conversations going on. And then at the end, we circle up and have a conversation of what was the experience about. And then we have integration services where we just get together and integrate and you know build community and, and talk through. And we're pretty layered. I'm very fortunate that uh, I believe, so I was chairman of higher ed appropriations. And what I would do before every legislative session, I'd put a stake in the ground. I'd say, based on conversations, here's what we're going to do in higher education this year. And that would get the conversation going. Instantly, people would say, no, that's the wrong place. They'd pick up the stake and want to move it somewhere else. That's when the conversations got real and people could collaborate. So having put a stake in the ground, people are coming to me saying, you're doing it wrong. Here's a way to do it more safely. Thank you for that input. We'll incorporate that or let's discuss that. And so fortunately, a lot of uh, licensed clinical social workers, psychedelic integration therapists, they've come to me saying, what are you doing? How are you doing it? Why are you doing it this way? Wouldn't this be safer? And I'm like, welcome aboard. Uh, mm -hmm. Please help us with this. So I have a lot of great people who I think always are making us safer and more sincere. When I've run ceremonies, <clears throat> facilitated those, it's been, <clears throat> excuse me, like I've always wanted it to be a lot more of a really tight container. It's kind of saying like, you know, here I have 
basically four guidelines. And within those guidelines, they're, they're pretty strict in the sense like, if that's not for you, that's cool. Yeah. But that's how we're going to do this experience. And it's something that I sort of need or request so that I'm able to fully enter into that experience and do that sort of live improvisational uh, processing of music with everybody. But it's it's one where like we're all definitely like on the same ship. We're all going to start and finish together. Yeah. And it's, you know, and respecting sort of the, the, the silence of the room, meaning just not chit-chatting and moving around too much. If you need to, leave the space and come back, that kind of stuff. Because it's sort of a very, I find it to be a very delicate space. In some ways, the deeper you get into some of those realms, and the closer and closer you're merging in this non-dualistic space, the more tender and delicate that becomes. You know, the subtlest, like, note or nuance can just push you boof right into the next stage and that's why like if i had a, a pair of people who are like you know this isn't for me and we want to chit chat for an hour i'd be like no bueno yeah. <laughs> you, you, this is not what we agreed to and a sitter would have to be like you guys need to either step outside or close it you know shut it up and get back to the work that we agreed to do and i know that sounds very stringent but a lot of the ceremonies i've heard about that people do it with intentional uh, psilocybin work it's usually quickly bleeds into something more outward and jubilant and uh, they have a great time. But that energy is in the medicine very much so, that sort of carnival-esque. It's very easy. And that's a great thing to do. No judgment against that. But I'm just saying, I found that a lot of the deeper inner work and the real therapeutic work is in that stillness. Yeah. And I'm curious if, if you've been playing around with that or what your discoveries have been. Well, so this this experience we had out on the salt flats, um, a couple people showed up like an hour and a half late and basically was like, yo, bro, hook us up. Right. And <laughs> that was so disturbing. And I realized that was on me because I hadn't set clear expectations. And that's, I mean, after that summer, I really pulled back. I'm like, I could get people hurt. I could get people lost. Um, traumatized, as you said. Traumatized. Oh, yeah. And so... Yeah really pulled back and, and moving a lot more in that direction. And, and if anyone wants to provide input on this, we are so receptive. We give the guide a lot of authority that we don't want to tell anyone exactly how they need to do it. And so each guide runs the ceremony how he or she wants. Um, but we, our ceremonies, again, they're often someone's first experience. Now we layer them with experienced folks so they can really relax into it because they know they're in good hands, but we're going for something where they dip their toes in and we're, our goal is to really build connection and community. I don't, we have one tenet, which is you can commune with the divine and receive direct guidance for your life. So that being the one tenet, who cares what I think, what anyone else thinks, just Try to get that connection. And I think we connect with the divine by connecting with self, others, and the universe. So worship to me, um, you know, when I have my hand in setting up what it's going to be, it's about connection. And so for us, I really value that time when people sit and talk. It's funny, you know, I told you my wife is autistic and Every single ceremony, I think, we've had someone who uh, says, I have autism. And a lot of them, it's like, you didn't tell me that. I knew that, <laughs> you know, when we first said hello. And they said, this is the most connected I have felt to humans in my life. And so uh, I love the blindfolded experience. I, there, there's really a gifted guide, psilocybin guide in Salt Lake, who I love journeying with her because it is in my space, my mind, my soul. But what we're really going for is this connection where worship is connecting with yourself, which you can do with the blindfold, but also other humans. And a lot of that is the chit chat. And you get to know each other and where they just, people feel open to talk and connect with others in a way they don't. And we can follow that up in our integration ceremonies, our sound baths. Because remember, our sacrament, it's not the deep 
real deep immersive experience. I want them to go to one of your ceremonies. I want them to go do it with this guy, that guy who's there. Mm. Do it there. We're going to have a we're going to be a safe journey for most people. Well, for all people, but we're going to be an introductory journey. So like you're saying, a lot of people are like, well, I don't want to go through all this. I don't want to watch these videos. I don't want, I can just do this in my buddy's basement. Okay, do that. But this is the way we do it because we want everyone to relax into it. Then go deeper somewhere else with someone else. Mm. Yeah, because you mentioned safety was a big part of uh, your intention. And so is that your main mechanism for trying to keep it safe is keeping the dosage low? Because I, I, I've seen people who everyone has a different tolerance level and mm-hmm. some people, a small amount is actually quite a bit for them. Yeah. Well, and I'm getting more that way too. Uh, I'm becoming more of the medicine. And so, uh, I, I used to like taking some in a ceremony with others. So I'd be on the same wavelength. I just go too deep with a gram, half a gram when I'm vibing off other people's energy. So now I barely take anything. Maybe I don't take anything, you know, one or two grams. We do lemon tech. So you're in it pretty fast and you know, if you want to re up and, uh, yeah, people can go awfully deep on one or two grams, but typically not as deep as a heroic dose. And so that is a safety thing, but then also, um, Like I said, we have so we're layered with so many people every ceremony, and we want people to have a good, comfortable first experience to explore the possibilities. And uh, hopefully, they do go deeper with other people in other settings. The term heroic dose is something I take umbrage with a bit because it comes up a lot. I I hear from other people, and it's as if there's some kind of hero. By, I mean, courageous dose might be appropriate term, but it's sort of like there's not necessarily a line in the sand because of Terrence McKenna that says five grams dried is oh now you're you're a hero because yeah. <laughs> that cannot be appropriate for you and for other people yeah. that's not enough actually and it's really very specific to the person. Yeah, I do need to stop using that because it's such a weird thing. I'm looking for an ego death in a heroic dose. <laughs> exactly, it's like a contradiction. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be a superhero of ego dissolution. <laughs> so what do you guys, um, what do you sort of, I, I hear where you're at now. And do you, what do you think you're thinking your plans might be for the future as far as either advocacy? Because there is so much going on right now. You are doing a lot of advocacy just by mm-hmm. doing this at all. Um, but where do you see the next steps being in this process? So Divine Assembly, um, I want to get myself off the stage as soon as possible. I want this to be a steve movement. And so, again, that's why I'm promoting other guides. And I, I, I try to get other people up on the stage. Uh, you know, you have to go beyond the founder. And there's a risk in religion that it becomes the founder's ego, the founder's personality. And so we're having a lot of meetings now where we're deciding what can we be? What do we want to be where I'm not at those? I take a back seat at those. And where I would like to spend the bulk of my time is in something I'm calling the chamber of entheogenic churches. And that's a 501c6, like a chamber of commerce, a restaurant association that can lobby. And uh, that's, I'm a lawyer Mm -hmm. and I'm a politician. And so uh, I love helping people start entheogenic churches and advising them. And that's what I want to do with my time is lobby Congress, lobby uh, state legislatures, local governments, just saying, like I'm doing with all the jurisdictions I'm working with, let's talk about entheogenic worship and why it's legal, what it should be. And we would have best housekeeping seal of approval where if you meet these safety and sincerity requirements, then uh, welcome to the Chamber of Entheogenic Churches. How can we help you? Yeah, I think that's amazing. I mean, there's one, just like you said, I haven't heard of anything that's been like this that's been really, really public, let alone doing events and so forth. And I think there's a lot of interest in this kind of thing because even in Oregon where uh, they'll be allowed to do uh, therapeutic use, it's nothing to do with religion, you know, that law as far as I understand it. And Correct. so 
you know, the standards about is like, well, the state will decide who can essentially be a guide or a clinic and how that will work. Um, this is a different path and a different model using law that already exists. And I think the end goal for both is similar. Maybe the difference inside divine assembly is that you don't, doesn't sound like you have that like dedicated therapeutic element where people are like working with that therapist. You're saying like you are sort of a doorway maybe or a connector to some of those other people, but those people theoretically are not working legally in the system. They're in the underground. If they're, for instance, in any state, technically besides Oregon at this point. And then you get into the gray area of decriminalization in certain municipalities, which is a whole other thing. But uh, how do you see yourself sort of bridging and, and weaving with some of these laws that are coming on board? Yeah, thank you. Perfect question. So medicalization is really important. We want the folks in white lab coats to figure out the medicinal therapeutic benefits of these substances, which they're doing. And uh, people are benefiting and so many people will benefit from that. But psychedelics, it's not just for medicine. It, it is for, I think in this Bob Jesse term, the, the betterment of well people. And uh, that is, is really important. And that can come through religion. That is just a different door to walk through. And it carries its own protections. I mean, I've long thought it is so silly for religions to say that their rights are under attack. They're not. In America, <laughs> religious rights are robust. They're very strong. And the Supreme Court gets that. Uh, you know, they've protected the Santeria Church from zoning ordinances, the ayahuasca churches we discussed. And uh, those protections are robust. And, you know, when you talk about medicalization, that often means wealthy white people get the benefit. Whereas religion, religion is something for the masses. And I'm really happy to put a stake in the ground and to learn as we go. And uh, I'm sure what we're doing right now won't be anything like what we're doing in five years. We'll just continue to receive all of this input and get better and safer and more sincere. And we're having so much healing right now with the people who are involved with this that it's, it's just the best thing I've ever been involved with. And um, really smart people are stepping up and they're saying, Steve, I'm not sure you know what you're doing. I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. Help me out. And uh, mm -hmm. so a lot of great, sincere people are really stepping in and helping improve this, build on this foundation that maybe I have laid. What about like if people want to do individual work or like they're just listening to this and they're like, I know a lot of people are interested in psilocybin work, but they don't know how to access it. Yeah. And they want to do it in a somewhat official manner. Can, are you only doing like these sort of group ceremonies? How open is this to strangers, so to speak? Yeah, I want it open to everyone. And so it's very easy to join. It's just name and email on our website, thedivineassembly.org. Um, and if people don't feel comfortable with that, it's a venerable religious tradition to take on a new name. So they can use a you know, make up a name, a spiritual name, make up a burner email, and then they're joined and they have the religious protections. And let me quickly jump in and say, it's not like, you know, saying divine and you're protected. If you're prosecuted, they will look to see, is this something just getting around trying to skirt drug laws or is this religion? And so what I have done, what I continue to do, what I advise people is, Come up with your own personal credo. What it's like your ten laws. I mean, what what were you before? What do you aspire to be? What what is the pathway that will get you there? So some of my things, for example, I won't have more than three drinks a week, but I won't have fewer than one. Because <laughs> to me, that's a connection. Hey, do you want to go grab a beer? And coffee, you know, same thing. Uh I run anxious, so it doesn't do a lot of good for me. No more than uh, four cups in a week, but no less than two. Because again, that's connection. Do you want to get coffee? But then my space. Every night when I go to bed, it's going to be organized. My things are going to be put away. 
And then my interactions with every single person. Have I built this person? Was I thinking about the other person? And then so many of my goals are about Sarah and about our kids and about the people in my life where put me on a stand. If, if, if swear me, put me under oath and swear me in. Uh, if people knew Steve Urquhart before the divine assembly and they see me now, they're like, you're changed brother. What, what has gotten into you? And I think I've embraced the divine. I've, I'm surrendering myself to the universe and just saying, do with me what you want. And if I can help other people, that's, that's great. So a lot of the ceremonies ahead, I would go in with the intention, okay, the divine assembly is so important. I want inspiration on what should I do? Cause this, this just matters. And they were all about me, about Steve. You're, you're pretty patriarchal misogynist, misogynist. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. And, and just things about, you know, I don't love fully. How can I be a better person? And that was a little frustrating. It was, it was good, but I'm like, okay, what about the divine assembly? And then I finally realized, okay, if I'm going to birth something, it needs to be with as little ego and good intention as possible. And so I don't think I was in a space to do that. And now I'm maybe a little more in a place where it can be without ego. I bring in other folks and it's not, it's less about me. Well, now that you're in this place, I mean, any thoughts about getting back into politics? And like, it, it, it's like you're a Republican, Mormon, conservative, and you wake up and then you left. <laughs> it's like, yeah. maybe you guys go back. And is that possible? No, I, I don't want, no, I wouldn't want to hold office. But I, I do like operating in the political arena. I continue to do that on LGBTQ rights and uh, women's rights. Um, I would like to be in the political arena advancing entheogenic worship. Uh, it's something the groundwork has been laid by so many great pioneers uh, who, man, they were, they were brave uh, doing it without the cases, case protection, case law that they helped make. And uh, I think right. on that foundation, I can maybe make a few contributions that help a lot of people worship as they see fit. And the minute I get this going, I'll have 20 churches. That many people have come to me. Then I think I'll have hundreds and yeah. maybe thousands. And that tells a story. And uh, it destigmatizes this. It's being destigmatized in medicine. It needs to be destigmatized in terms of spirituality also. Well, lastly, are there any tips you would give people who are sort of moving into this space or interested in being advocates or being part of this movement that's happening? Yeah, um, I'd say go slow. There's not a rush on this and uh, learn and experiment. And, you know, again, what we do is let people dabble their toes in the water and, and learn as we go. And uh, I just say it's, it's a great way to turn off the default mode network and really connect with ourselves, connect with others, connect with the universe and be patient with the process. Don't go in with too many expectations and bring along people as you go, build these connections to other human beings. Cool. Well, um, where can people, you know, dig in and, and learn more about everything? Yeah. You know, I meant to say one thing. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about you one thing. Sometimes when we journey in these spaces, uh, we can be a bit lost because they're new and different and strange. Uh, I lay cairns as I go. If I start to get scared and experience, I make, I truly in my mind, I make a cairn and sometimes I'll be lost and I'll see a cairn that I made. So thank you for that. Um, if they go to the divine there's a lot of information there. And uh, if they email to info at the divine I'm the guy answering that. And I'll quickly give my phone number and I'll talk with anyone who's interested in this space. This is what I want to do with my life. And uh, I'm very excited about it and excited about connecting with other humans. And good to connect with you, brother. I appreciate your work. And if I can help in any way, please let me know. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, so much for coming on the show. Uh, it's great to know you, call you a friend now, and it's just, I admire the work that you're doing out there and the bravery and courage that it takes in telling your story so wonderfully and openly and beautifully. 
So hopefully we'll talk again and uh, check out that summer revival. The link is in the show notes down there, but you can also just check it out at uh, thedivineassembly.org. It's the June 18th through June 20th. They are doing their three-day, two-night festival at Seabase in Utah. This song that you're hearing in the background is called Bones, featuring Bio Akumalafe. You can hear it without me talking over it wherever you listen to music. Spotify, Apple, and so forth, as well as eastforce.org. You can download it in 24-bit high definition, and you can also order the pre-order, that is, the vinyl, which will have the entire possible album that will ship out in July. The full album releases on July 23rd, if you're wondering, with all 11 tracks. Uh, Bio's a, a beautiful soul. Again, he was on podcast 112. If you want to listen to what the full conversation we had that these words are sampled from. Thanks for uh, checking out the Patreon, our council as we call it, at patreon.com slash eastforest. And thank you to all of you who support in all the ways you do. And thanks for always uh, saying hi. You guys keep walking your walk. Don't take any shit. But if you do, you know what to do. Do it with grace. What do you do with me? Maybe 